Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Who would have thought that 30 years ago this was a forgotten village in the middle of nowhere? Now it has become thoroughly modern. There were modern cottages alongside old houses and new streets were being built from time to time. Instead of a tiny corner store, there were now several large stores and even a small shopping center and a cinema had appeared. Several more facilities were under construction to improve the infrastructure. The man driving on the perfectly smooth road occasionally shook his head. He wondered about the new developments that had taken place. Alejandro had a constant thought in his mind. When his mother got really sick and passed away, he would inherit the property, demolish everything, and build a modern house in its place. He could already imagine himself sitting on the veranda, installing a pool. He envisioned how well he would live there alone. For some reason, his wife and daughter, who were waiting for him at home, didn't fit into his plans at all. Why would they? He couldn't even decide whether he wanted to save his family further or not. He had too many doubts about it. Alejandro turned right and finally stopped near his mother's house. The woman was standing by the gazebo, laughing and resting a small hand on her chest. Javier, who was much larger and stronger than Alejandro, loomed over their mother, probably sharing another funny story. Alejandro didn't want to see his brother. He always felt like Javier was taller, better, and stronger. He always sensed competition from his brother's side. Javier was a good-natured, cheerful guy, quite hard-working, and interested in life. He never complained just for the sake of it and didn't seek blame from others. Each time, Alejandro thought that Javier was being hypocritical. Maybe he was judging others based on himself? Alejandro, you're late. His mother said jokingly, wagging her finger at him. I was stuck in the traffic jam on the way out. A truck stopped, but it's moving now. It took only 20 minutes for me, but apparently others were waiting even longer, Alejandro replied. His mother, standing on her tiptoes, gave her son a peck on the cheek and hugged him. Then she headed back into the house. Javier firmly shook his brother's hand and gestured to the bench. Apparently, they had decided to have lunch at the table in the gazebo. Javier leaned against a high beam, bracing his shoulder. He was standing almost half-turned and still looked taller even now. Why are you so sad? Has something happened again? Javier asked, nodding to his brother. Alejandro waved it off. He had no intention of going into details. Soon, their mother emerged, carrying a white tray. Javier sprang up to help her, taking the tray and another one. In no time, they had arranged all the tableware on the table, cold soup, homemade bread, and cabbage pies. In the center of the table was a salad made from homegrown vegetables, and on the side was a plate with sliced watermelon. The woman looked at her adult sons with pride. She coughed and turned away, covering her mouth with a handkerchief. Apparently, the illness was taking an increasingly strong hold. It's okay, it's okay. I must have walked too much today, said the mother, waving her hand. She was not one of those elderly women who manipulated their health. On the contrary, she tried to worry her sons as little as possible. Sometimes, the woman was so focused on her health that she would drift away from the current conversation. So, Alejandro, how is everything at your home? Is it getting better? The mother asked. Alejandro grimaced as if on a leash. He had recently complained to his mother over the phone, but he never expected her to discuss it openly in front of his brother. It's all right, Alejandro replied curtly. You need to keep the relationship with Laura. You both have such a wonderful daughter. Laura works, takes care of the child, and handles all the household chores. Women like her are hard to come by these days, Alejandro. She doesn't throw tantrums, doesn't ask for anything, and even gives you gifts. If you acted like that, I'd never give you a gift in your life. You need to cherish her, the elderly woman said. I understand, Alejandro replied. Alejandro was pensive for the rest of the evening, and they talked a lot, but the conversation quickly veered back to family matters. Only now did Alejandro notice that Javier's car wasn't there. He must have taken it for repairs. 
But right now, Alejandro just wanted one thing, to go home alone. When Alejandro didn't have a car, Javier gave him rides hundreds of times to wherever he needed to go. Refusing his brother now would be, at the very least, impolite. Do you not think this has dragged on for too long? Alejandro began from a distance. They had just gotten into the car after bidding farewell to their mother. Javier fastened his seatbelt, clicking it into place. He looked focused and somewhat confused, as if he were considering various possibilities in his head. Javier had enough work-related problems at the moment. He had started his own business, and things weren't going as he had hoped. Alejandro was satisfied with it, but he didn't want to discuss it. When they had driven a bit farther, Alejandro repeated his question. Javier looked at him with confusion. What specifically? Javier asked. The illness of our mother, Alejandro said, shrugging. Don't you find it all strange? She's been sick for so long, and there's been no improvement. I feel like the doctors are deliberately milking us for money. Us? Javier asked and laughed. Alejandro slouched, sinking back into the driver's seat. Well, actually, I'm the one paying all of our mother's medical bills, so you don't need to tell me now that they're trying to squeeze money out of us. Besides, the doctor warned us. There are no guarantees. I told you right from the start that they wouldn't be able to cure it. What we're doing now is just trying to prolong her life as much as possible. Alejandro had a habit of attributing himself to things he had no connection with, so Javier wasn't surprised by such a question. Javier looked out of the window once again and said, Do you have a lawyer? Of course, I do. Are you thinking about starting a business too? Javier asked. I need to find out how to get a divorce without paying alimony. And preferably, how to take my wife's apartment, or at least a share of it. I've worked for so many years, I don't want to leave with nothing, Alejandro explained. No way. I won't help you with these black deeds. Javier barked. Not only are you trying to grab someone else's property, but you also want to leave your own child without a penny. No, Alejandro, you're on your own with this. Furious, Alejandro gripped the steering wheel, his fingertips turning white from the tension. He bit his lip, nearly drawing blood, but quickly regained his composure. Alejandro tried to change the subject of their conversation. On both sides, there were vast fields, some covered in tall green grass and others completely bare and black. Alejandro, think it over. The mother is right. When you find a woman like the one you have, you should cherish her because they are a rare find. I don't know what she found in you, of course. But since she loves you, be kind and respect her. Javier said in parting. He left some money for gas on the seat and then got out of the car. Javier headed to his private house. The small cottage community, which was now part of the town, was right at the border. Literally, a couple of meters away, the town began. Alejandro turned and went straight to avoid the traffic jam in the center. At that time, there were always plenty of cars gathered there, and when the car was finally near their home, Alejandro was irritated. He thought about how everyone around him was constantly giving him advice on how to live. He was angry, but more than anything, he was angry at himself. When he entered the apartment, his wife immediately sensed that it wasn't a good time to start a conversation. Laura handed him another bank statement. More debts that he hadn't paid. Laura had given up on trying to talk to him. She had tried hundreds of times to reason with him, to show that this lifestyle wouldn't lead to anything good, but he didn't even want to listen. He argued that everyone lived taking out loans and that in America, it was a normal way of life, but they were catastrophically short of money. And what are we going to do? Soon the amount will be as much as your salary. Laura said. She pressed a finger to her lips when her husband began to respond. He started yelling in his usual manner, but from Laura's behavior, he realized that their daughter was asleep. Involuntarily, he looked at the clock. It was already 10 o'clock. What can I do? The interest rate is skyrocketing. I need to declare bankruptcy, he said. Sort it out yourself. I'm tired of it. 
I've told you a thousand times not to take out more loans. And you kept saying you would pay them off one by one. You just don't listen to me, Laura said, displeased. She had stopped trying to say anything to him. Alejandro was a man who fervently believed only in his own point of view, and everything else was just empty words to him. He had driven himself into a corner. Fortunately, he took care of most of the debts that had already grown to a catastrophic level before their official marriage. Laura hoped that, in case of a divorce, she wouldn't be held responsible for his debts. At first, Alejandro thought he wouldn't pay, and the debt collectors would eventually back off. But the situation got worse with each passing year. Laura feared that her husband would eventually be taught a physical lesson on the street, and she couldn't complain to anyone about it. Well, if you could help me with some money, then we've, Alejandro said. No, I've listened to you and sold the summer house. And what? You paid off one loan and took out two new ones. No, that's enough. Are you going to ask me to sell my apartment again? You've left me with nothing. My salary barely covers our family's expenses. Don't tell me that I supposedly don't help, Laura firmly stated. Lately, Laura, who used to be compliant and calm, has begun to assert her boundaries. Naturally, this didn't sit well with Alejandro. He liked the time in their marriage when his wife did everything he wanted and he didn't have to do anything in return. But now she was living for herself and their daughter. At least, that's how Alejandro saw it as he continued to live in her apartment, dress himself, and receive treatment all on his wife's dime. Alejandro sat down at the table, leaned back in his chair, and pulled the plate of food closer to him. He had become terribly hungry on the way home. His mother's words kept circling in his mind, and maybe his mother was right, he should have been cherishing Laura. But since their daughter was born, Laura had gained 15 kilograms and lost 10, and the remaining 5 wouldn't budge. Taking advantage of the situation, Alejandro constantly criticized his wife for her extra weight. Additionally, Laura quickly started earning more than her husband after she began working. She managed to handle household chores and work, but it took a toll on her appearance. Naturally, Alejandro couldn't let another opportunity pass to hurt her feelings. He grimaced again while looking at his wife. Laura already knew that a series of belittling comments was about to begin, so she simply turned and left for another room. Alejandro scowled, unhappy that he had been denied the opportunity for pleasure later in the evening. He was eating, gazing into his plate, and pondering how to improve his financial situation. Fortunately, at least no one at work knew about his debts. However, Alejandro was confident that it was only a matter of time before the entire situation would come to the surface. Alejandro arrived at work in a reasonably good mood. However, his mood suddenly improved when he noticed a new colleague in the office. A very young woman with an aloof appearance kept glancing at him. Less than an hour passed before they began to flirt with each other. Nora, don't fall for this idiot, Eleonora said, pulling the new colleague aside. He may act like a hero and a handsome guy in public, but in reality, he has a family and a child, by the way. Eleonora rolled her eyes. Nora wasn't the first woman this guy had tried to charm. He seemed to have a sporting interest, which Eleonora disapproved of. But Nora just smiled. He's the head of the department, by the way. He needs a proper wife, and he'd be the director in a couple of years. Nora said with a smile. Look, he's a promising young man. So what if he has a wife and child? Now, do we have to avoid all the married men? And the single ones, apparently, aren't worth the trouble, not even worth getting involved with. You're a fool, Nora. God sees everything. You will bitterly regret your words. Only in the movies do they take a man from his family, and everything turns out fine. In reality, you won't escape problems, Eleonora said. Oh, come on. You can't take anyone away. He's not a calf on a leash. If he wants to leave, he'll do it on his own, and if he doesn't, well, that's it. I just flirted with him. Why are you making such a big deal out of it? Nora asked. 
She ordered coffee and, holding the cup with her long, nail-adorned fingers, sat at a high table, gazing out the window at the neatly trimmed green trees. Because I brought you here to work, Nora, not to chase men. Find someone else to get your attention. He's got a terrible personality. I warned you. You'll have to deal with it yourself, Eleonora said. Nora simply shrugged her shoulders. If her friend didn't want to talk to her, that was fine. But Alejandro had genuinely piqued her interest. She had seen him not only in their flirtatious exchanges, but also at work. He truly seemed promising to her. If she could seduce him and bring him under her influence, he would climb the career ladder very quickly. Maybe she wouldn't have to work at all in the end. Nora sat there, trying to maintain a work-related conversation with her friend. She thought about taking Alejandro on a date after work before their flirting lost its charm. And if she waited too long, their conversations might remain at the level of fleeting glances. Nora didn't share her thoughts with Eleonora, but she planned to check social media after work. Perhaps she could find information about her chosen one and his family. Nora believed that if Alejandro hadn't advanced to the director's chair with all the other qualities he had, it meant his wife wasn't interested in his progress. And that meant he might find someone better. If only Nora knew how this whole story would end, she probably wouldn't have ventured into this mess. Nora, are you listening to me? Eleonora asked. Yes, of course. I'm just wondering when payday is going to be now that I've just started. You know, I have to pay for the rent, Nora quickly found an excuse. She pretended that all the previous discussions about Alejandro no longer mattered to her. Meanwhile, Laura arrived home. She had left her daughter at the kindergarten and switched on her computer to take orders. When the doorbell rang, Laura snapped out of her work and glanced at the clock. The day had passed by unnoticed, her head buzzing from the abundance of information. Laura got up and gave one last look at the project specifications on her screen. She needed to pick up her daughter from daycare in an hour. She approached the door and peered through the peephole. There was Javier, shifting from foot to foot. She opened the door, and he warmly greeted her. Is your husband home? Javier asked. He'll be home within the hour, maybe sooner, Laura replied, inviting him to come into the apartment. He entered, looking around as if the apartment could have changed during the few months of his absence. Laura observed Javier and couldn't help but think that she had chosen the wrong brother. She often thought that when she saw him. It was sad that life had unfolded in this way. Tell me, Laura, how is everything going? Javier asked. Do you want a pretty picture or the truth? Laura asked. When he looked into her eyes, he saw disappointment. He felt sorry for her, but at the same time, he was angry that his brother had completely ignored his advice. Laura sat down, placing a kitchen towel on her lap. She was trying hard not to cry. How can I put it? Lately, our relationship hasn't resembled a marriage anymore. Actually, it hasn't for a long time. He's been drinking heavily, accumulating debts again and again. My God, Javier, if only you knew how tired I am of all this, she said. Laura gazed out the window, her eyes filling with tears. Her face, still pale as porcelain, gave her an air of aristocracy. Laura wiped the tears from her cheek with the back of her hand and forced a smile. Others got into worse situations, right? She asked. Just because they're worse doesn't mean you have to endure them. I know perfectly well what my brother is like, and I don't have any illusions about him. I'm sorry that you've had to deal with him. He's a difficult person. Moreover, he's entirely incapable of admitting his own mistakes. If you need any help, just give me a call. We'll figure something out, Javier said with a smile. Laura nodded as if she wanted to keep the conversation light. A sound of a key turning signaled the arrival of her husband. She knew he was home. She jumped up and began setting the table. Javier watched as she meticulously tried to hide traces of her tears. It was abnormal when someone in a family hid their feelings to avoid upsetting another. Hey, good to see you. Alejandro said, walking into the kitchen. 
He shook Javier's hand firmly. I stayed late at work. We have a big company report coming up soon. I wanted to talk to you, and I also need you to look at some papers. You have more experience in this matter, Alejandro said. Alejandro took out a folder of papers and went to change. Laura quickly set the table, changed her clothes, and went outside to pick up their daughter from kindergarten. The brothers sat at the table, having dinner and discussing work-related matters. When Laura returned, Javier was gone. Apparently, they had enough time to have a conversation without getting into an argument, a rarity with Alejandro these days. Most of their recent conversations ended in an argument or a relationship dispute. That evening, Alejandro was lost in his thoughts. He didn't argue with his wife. He was constantly on the phone instead. Laura tried to act as if everything was okay with her. At least one evening should be peaceful, she thought. The daughter was a bit fussy, wanting to spend time with her father, but Alejandro snapped at her so harshly that little Wanda got scared and went back to her mother. Alejandro sat at the table, looking at his laptop, turning it away from his wife. Laura didn't suspect that her husband was checking out the new co-worker's photos on social media. This had been going on for a few days. Laura tried not to provoke conflicts, as her husband had been like a powder keg lately. They had a small argument that night, but it ended relatively peacefully. The couple went to bed. Laura couldn't fall asleep. Her daughter was ill, and she kept listening to her breathing. Even though the little girl was sleeping in another room, she knew that she would hear her cough if it happened. Her sleep was restless, nervous, and anxious. When the phone rang, Laura checked the time. It was already three in the morning. Had she still not managed to fall asleep? She couldn't consider this troubled sleep a normal night's rest. Alejandro got up, swinging slightly as he left the bed. He picked up his phone and held it to his ear. There was silence, then a crying voice. Mother passed away, Alejandro said softly, turning to his wife. Laura jumped up, wanting to comfort him, but he didn't need words of comfort. Alejandro behaved as if nothing had happened, as if it were not his mother, who had just passed away, but a project at work. Laura realized he was only thinking about the inheritance. It was hard for her to contemplate how cold and cruel her husband was, even towards his own mother. Alejandro didn't want to discuss it. A few days later, he left, apparently to attend the funeral. He didn't take his wife with him, and he didn't rush to explain the reason either. Laura had a good relationship with Margarita. But if she went to the funeral by herself, where would she leave her daughter? And if she went with her daughter, what type of transport would she use? Plus, there was a significant likelihood that her husband would make a scene if she attended. Laura thought that she would arrange a service at the local church for Margarita instead. It was better than completely ignoring the situation. When Alejandro arrived, there were already many people gathered. Javier was in charge of the funeral arrangements as Alejandro had distanced himself. He had no intention of spending a lot of money just to put his mother's body in damp soil. Alejandro was clearly angry, losing his temper with those around him. Everyone kindly attributed it to heightened nervousness and the tragedy. Everyone knew Margarita was sick, but no one expected her death to come so soon. There were many tearful faces around. Margarita had been a kind person, and many would miss her goodness. Alejandro, completely bewildered, was sitting there, looking around. He was surveying the house, mentally calculating how much it would cost to demolish it and build something new, modern, and beautiful. An inner voice was urging him to sell everything and pay off the debts, even if only partially. But Alejandro wanted the family house too much, where he wouldn't live alone, but most likely with Nora. Why are you sitting there? Let's go. It's time. Javier said. Javier's face was blackened from grief, and he couldn't concentrate on anything. His eyes darted around, and he felt a wave of nausea. People approached, offering their condolences. Time flew by unnoticed. Soon, a small mound of earth with a cross on it rose before them. People began to disperse, and the funeral would take place in Margarita's home. A neighbor and friend had offered to take care of the cooking and serving the guests. 
Javier, knowing that everything was taken care of at the house, was standing by his mother's grave. Alejandro was standing next to him, but his thoughts were far from condolences. What do you think? Who will get the inheritance? Alejandro asked. If you don't hold a grudge, you know she always treated me much better. Maybe this time, everything will come to me as well. I wanted to talk to you. After all, you have your business and a house. Perhaps you'll consider giving up your share in my favor. You know the situation I'm in with debts. We've just buried our mother, and you're talking about dividing her money? Javier asked. He turned his head slowly towards his brother. Javier had no illusions about him, but this was too much. When will I see you again, then? Let's not keep this up, okay? We both knew this would happen soon. Mother was seriously ill, and it's a relief for her now. Do you even realize what she has left us? The house, an apartment, bank accounts. Mother never disclosed how much she managed to save during all these years. Maybe there's enough for another apartment? And you tell me you're not interested in any of it? I won't believe that, Alejandro snapped. You can judge me all you want. I'm not in the mood to talk about money right now, Javier replied. He walked towards the car, and Alejandro followed suit. A cemetery on a gloomy day, with clouds resembling somber ghosts floating across the sky, covering everything in dull shades, presents a gloomy spectacle, branches of trees swaying in the wind, dropping raindrops like tears for the departed. Wet tombstones and crosses, like silent sentinels, stand guard over the rest of the deceased. The mist shrouding the ground gives the place a mystical aura. The silence, broken only by bird songs and the rustling of leaves, accentuates its solemnity. Shadows cast by the gravestones create an illusion of movement, as if the souls of the departed had come out for a stroll. The grayness and melancholy of the place perfectly mirror the mood of those who come here to pay their respects to their loved ones. Alone, Alejandro felt a sense of dread as the evening descended. The longer he stayed alone, the harder it would be for him. He quickly joined his brother. Javier was sitting in the car, deep in thought. Alejandro approached from the side, leaning his elbows on the open window. Javier, you'll work later. We're all busy as usual. So, what do you say? Will you give it up? Alejandro asked. Javier took a deep breath, but Alejandro was not going to back down. All right, forget it. Do you really think you'll get anything? His brother asked. Let's agree to split it evenly to avoid any disputes, he continued. Alejandro knew he wouldn't split it evenly if he received more. From Javier's expression, it was clear that he was aware of his brother's ulterior motive. I hope you're just in shock. When you snap out of it, You'll be ashamed that you discussed the inheritance at our mother's funeral, Javier said, moving from the spot. Alejandro, who was leaning on the car with his entire weight, stumbled forward, barely maintaining his balance. Javier's car sloshed through the mud, and Alejandro managed to step back, ensuring no dirt marked his pants. He spat on the ground and stared in the direction where his brother's car had been, reduced to a distant... Alejandro glanced at the cemetery gate one last time and nodded, as if responding to an inner dialogue. He headed towards his car, deciding not to stay for the wake. Otherwise, they would have had a worse argument with his brother. Alejandro was driving home, lost in his thoughts. The road, a thin thread winding among slender trees, seemed to be trying to conceal the mysterious world of nature from prying eyes. Sometimes, it ascended the small hills, revealing boundless vistas to the traveler, while at other times, it descended into valleys where tree canopies formed a green canopy, hiding the sky. The man, lost in his thoughts, slowly followed this road. He had long grown accustomed to the beauty of this place. All the turns, valleys, and fields seemed entirely ordinary to him. Now, as he passed a clearing where the sun played on dewdrops, he smiled. However, his smile was not about the childhood memories of running through this grass. It was about the thoughts of acquiring this plot in his inheritance and waking up in the morning to enjoy the peace and nature. 
Everything around was serene, and the only sounds were the occasional birdsong and the rustling of leaves. Alejandro couldn't help but ponder his own life and how trivial and insignificant his current worries seemed. His thoughts wove together into a single tangle, encompassing his wife, marriage, daughter, and his young lover. When he exited onto the highway, leaving behind the beauty of the countryside, he was fully absorbed in his thoughts. Occasional drizzles of rain fell, and somewhere, a raven croaked. Suddenly, Alejandro snapped out of his thoughts, realizing that things could be much simpler. He made a few phone calls, starting with an old acquaintance. They discussed his plan and then laughed at how he could realize it much more simply than initially planned. If he committed his wife to a mental institution, they would divorce, and he would inherit the estate. These thoughts stirred Alejandro so much that he wondered why he hadn't thought of them sooner. Beautiful images of the future popped into his head, where he lived in an apartment that would soon be his property. For some reason, his daughter didn't fit into his future. When Alejandro arrived home, he had an excited look. His wife didn't expect him to return so cheerfully after his mother's funeral. Get ready. Pack your things for a few days. I'll take our daughter to the neighbors. I'll pay her, don't worry, Alejandro quickly said. His wife stared at him, not understanding what was happening. Alejandro brushed her off and spoke quickly again. I don't have time to explain. I'll tell you in the car. Laura decided not to escalate the situation. Lately, they have struggled to find common ground. Laura packed her belongings into a small suitcase, but their daughter was no longer in the apartment. A terrible premonition crept over Laura, but she was trying to ignore it. Alejandro came home incredibly happy. His wife was so bewildered that she couldn't even speak before they administered her a sedative and put her in a wheelchair. Alejandro clapped his hands in delight. He gave a substantial sum of money to his acquaintance and then headed home. He picked up his daughter at the neighbor's and brought her home. Where's mom? The little girl asked. She's gone. You don't have a mom anymore. Alejandro snapped. He didn't even bother to console his own daughter. He locked her in her room and then retrieved a bottle of brandy he had been saving for a special occasion. Alejandro drank several glasses and sat on the couch in front of the TV, dreaming about his future life. But the situation turned out to be much more complex than he had imagined. The apartment would remain his daughter's until she turned 18. His plans to get rid of the child were dashed. Alejandro decided to wait until his daughter turned 18 and then ask her to transfer the apartment to him, perhaps by creating a story to make her believe it was the right thing to do. He hadn't realized how much Laura took care of things until now. The decision to divorce had put all responsibilities on his shoulders. His home was gradually turning into chaos, and there was no food to eat. Alejandro didn't even realize how many responsibilities his wife had taken on. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Alejandro invited Nora to a restaurant. She occasionally crossed her legs, and her face displayed a sense of contentment. Nora was aware of how Alejandro had dealt with his wife. For some reason, it never occurred to her that she might end up in the same situation. You know what? Move in with me, Alejandro said. Really? Nora asked in astonishment. She had taken his invitation as a green light for their relationship to progress. It meant he was ready for more serious steps. Nora had already planned out her near future in her mind. Alejandro had his plans too, but they didn't align. Nora hoped he would provide for her, and she, as his inspiration, wouldn't need to work. Alejandro hoped that Nora would assume all the responsibilities of a wife while maintaining the charm of a lover. Yet, at this moment, neither of them cared about the differences in their plans. They gazed at each other with love. The restaurant was bathed in soft light, creating a cozy atmosphere. The tables were arranged to allow guests to enjoy intimacy and comfort. In the center of the hall, a large fireplace not only warmed the room but also added to its charm. They were so engrossed in each other that it seemed like the rest of the world ceased to exist for them. The girl smiled gently, looking into her partner's eyes, who, in turn, couldn't tear his gaze away from her. 
Their hands were intertwined, and every gesture, every touch, spoke of the fact that they were meant for each other. People who occasionally glanced at them immediately thought that they were in love and clearly not a married couple. But no one suspected who these people were. It couldn't be said that this woman had broken up a family and this man had sent his own wife to a mental institution. The waiter brought their order and they started their dinner while continuing to exchange tender glances and smiles. After spending time in the restaurant, the girl was clearly inclined to move in right away. They went to her rented apartment and Nora hastily packed her essentials. Within an hour, she was at the man's apartment. He didn't tell her that the apartment belonged to his wife, but he was confident that he would succeed with the apartment, the money, and his daughter. Enjoying each other's company, the loving couple was lying on the bed. The bedroom was decorated in Provence style. It was a cozy and bright space, filled with warmth and comfort. The walls were painted in light tones, the wooden floor was adorned with parquet, and the wooden furniture had a distinct weathered look. The bed featured an ornate wrought iron headboard, and the windows had lightweight curtains made of natural fabrics. A whitewashed chest of drawers stood to the side, and on the right, there was a wardrobe with large mirrors. It was bright and cozy at any time of the day. Nora lit a few candles. She returned to bed, lying on her lover's shoulder. What do you think the future holds for us? She asked. Us? Well, I'll advance in my career and get the inheritance from my mother. Maybe I'll sell it or build a house on the plot. When it's all over, we'll definitely celebrate, the man said without going into details. What about your wife? You're officially still married, in case you've forgotten, she said. Nora raised herself on her elbows, gazing at the man with an inquisitive look. The first raindrops tapped on the window. Spring was a special time when nature seemed to pause in anticipation of blossoming. Raindrops slowly slid down the glass, leaving transparent trails behind. In the distance beyond the window, the silhouettes of trees were shrouded in a misty fog. The houses, lined up on the horizon, were almost entirely immersed in darkness. Somewhere, a few windows were still lit. The sun had already set beyond the horizon, and the sky was painted in soft shades of pink and violet. The rain softly rustled, soothing and lulling. The air was filled with freshness and coolness, making it pleasant to breathe deeply. The window was open. How was he supposed to answer this question? Alejandro was listening to the rain and the rustling of the leaves. How much longer could he deceive Nora without telling her about the debts and other matters? How much longer could he lie to her about the apartment? And what if his career plans fall through? All these questions suddenly overwhelmed him. The evening twilight deepened, and the raindrops became less noticeable against the darkening sky. This was the time when you could stop, forget about everyday worries, and enjoy the beauty of nature renewing itself after its winter slumber. This spring rain could be seen as a sign that he was starting anew. But the burden of the past wouldn't let go. The mistress repeated her question. He was taken aback and nearly jumped in surprise. Are you even listening to me? She asked, furrowing her brow. I need to know what you're planning to do in this situation. Oh, it's nothing. She'll stay there for a couple of weeks, then I'll file for divorce. It should be quick now since she's incapacitated. I've already found a lawyer to handle it. So don't worry. In a month or two, we'll be divorced, Alejandro quickly lied. In reality, he had no idea what he would do with this situation. But when he brought his daughter home the next day, everything got even worse. Nora had no idea that not only would she have to live in this apartment, but she would also have to raise a child who she had no desire for. A scandal, which typically developed gradually in their relationship, flared up within seconds this time. I'm not going to deal with someone else's child. Put her in an orphanage. Nora shouted, trembling with impatience. She was so furious that she couldn't even control herself, and the tension made her feel nauseated. Most of all, she was angry that she couldn't convey her position to her lover. Alejandro stood there, shrugging. You're born to take care of kids, he said. What nonsense is that? 
We're not born for anything. Have you gone crazy? I don't want my own kids, and you're suggesting I raise a child with you and your wife? No, it's not going to work out. Nora firmly stated. While the adults argued, the little girl cried, locked in her room. She wept for her mother, calling out to her, but no one else would come to her rescue. Exhausted from the argument, Alejandro was sitting alone in the kitchen. Nora was talking on the balcony with someone on the phone. He couldn't hear her words, but he saw her animated gestures. Apparently, she was complaining to another girl. The man poured himself a glass of alcohol, finished it, and stared into space. He needed to resolve all of this as soon as possible if he didn't want to lose Nora and end up alone with the child. Maybe, indeed, placing the child in an orphanage or boarding school was the best solution. When they both calmed down, they sat in the kitchen, drinking. Nora complained that she was tired from work and that, now that they were living together, perhaps Alejandro could take on the financial responsibilities. The man shifted away from the topic, and Nora decided not to insist. After all, they had just started living together. Soon she would find out how to pull the right strings to get what she wanted from him. Late spring evenings in the courtyard of a multi-story building are a remarkable time when nature finally awakens from its winter slumber. The air became warm and pleasant, the sun slowly descended towards the horizon, and shadows grew longer. The trees in the courtyard were already dressed in green attire. Leaves became increasingly vibrant and lush, and the grass was about to become thick and succulent. People came out to enjoy the last warmth before summer arrived. Children played joyfully on the playground, while adults engaged in conversations on the benches, relishing the spring air. The sky was painted in shades of pink and orange, and the sun set lower, illuminating the city with its last rays. The air was filled with the scents of the blossoming trees that surround the building. Flower beds displayed a variety of colors, carefully tended by local retirees. This evening is a perfect time to savor the spring. Summer was just around the corner. Javier, who finally felt relieved from heavy emotions, came to visit his brother to have a talk. Javier wanted to contribute to the memorial on their mother's grave and offered his brother to share the expenses. Furthermore, there was an opportunity to enroll their niece in a private school. All of these matters needed to be discussed in the coming days. Javier called his brother and said he would come in a few days. However, how his brother initially rejected the idea and then reluctantly agreed made Javier ponder. Javier, your name is Javier, isn't it? Said an elderly woman, waving to him. The plump old lady was sitting on a long bench, spreading her legs and placing a long cane between them. Yes, I'm Javier, the man replied calmly. Are you Alejandro's brother? I've seen you, you used to come into the apartment. You used to, the lady corrected herself. Yes, that's right, I'm his brother, Javier said. From Javier's tone, he understood that the situation was clearly not a positive one. You should influence your brother. He's completely lost it. No wife, no child. He brought home some floozy, they argue every day, and then they make up in bed so loudly that the whole building can hear. The old lady said, Seeing the surprise on Javier's face, the old lady realized she had told him too much too soon. It's your right to do as you please. But I won't tolerate it for long either. If you don't influence him, I'll call the police. It's not right at all. The old lady stated firmly. Javier didn't fully understand her last suggestion. He nodded and then headed towards the entrance. He quickly climbed the stairs and knocked on the door, but no one answered. He knocked again, distinctly hearing bottles clinking. Javier rolled his eyes. Their mother had put so much effort into trying to get Alejandro to stop drinking like a devil. It seemed to have worked only temporarily. Maybe there was some truth in the old lady's words. The apartment, which used to be cozy, bright, and spacious, had turned into a nightmare. Empty bottles and garbage bags were strewn everywhere, and a nauseating odor of cheap alcohol lingered in the air. Javier looked at his brother, who was swaying. What the hell? 
Javier almost whispered, not understanding what was happening. He entered the apartment and closed the door behind him. Alejandro slowly staggered into the kitchen, and trash was scattered all around. Javier took a deep breath. He hadn't seen such chaos in a long time. What struck him the most was the absence of Laura and little Wanda. Javier tried to keep his composure, although he really wanted to grab his brother by the shoulders and shake him so hard that his teeth rattled. It's all gone, everything's ruined, Alejandro muttered. Javier stared at him, not sure if he was looking at his own brother. From an excess drinking of alcohol, his face had swollen, and he seemed to be looking at Javier, but as if through him, his focus was impossible to discern. Alejandro slumped into a chair, which creaked under his weight. The kitchen was a nightmare. The window was wide open. The laughter from the children on the playground was audible. Some mothers were calling a child. On the street, there was an atmosphere of approaching happiness. Mere meters from this playground, where happy mothers and children played, was an apartment where a man was burying himself alive. Javier grabbed his brother and dragged him into the shower. He turned on the ice-cold water and held the struggling Alejandro under the frigid stream. He yelled and shrieked, but quickly surrendered. Javier was much bigger, stronger, and more determined. He made Alejandro change into clean clothes and fed him a few cups of strong coffee. Javier ordered food and then, quickly arranging for the garbage to be removed, cleared it away from the door. After drinking a few cups of coffee and eating some fatty food, Alejandro began to look somewhat more human. He wasn't completely sober yet, but at least he was now coherent enough to hold a conversation. Where's Laura? Javier asked. I put her in the asylum. I thought the apartment would be mine, but no. No. Alejandro yelled and slammed his fist on the table. Javier took a deep breath. Now he was struggling with the overwhelming desire to hit his brother. He didn't immediately realize that Alejandro was speaking seriously, not just making a joke. I did. I really sent her to the asylum. It turns out the apartment belongs to the little girl. Nora didn't want to live with her, so I gave her to an orphanage, Alejandro repeated. He bent his fingers with each sentence, and it was utterly unclear what he was thinking. Javier, immersed in shock, stared at his brother with eyes of disbelief. He couldn't fathom that Alejandro could treat his family this way. To put his wife in a mental institution just to avoid inconveniencing his lover and to send his own daughter to an orphanage? It felt like he had taken his wife and child on a lease, and now he had returned them as if they were no longer needed. When Javier realized it, he had shivers down his spine. He swallowed hard, gazing at his brother, who simply shrugged as if he were talking about replenishing the chicken coop, not about the destruction of lives. Javier looked at his brother, who appeared to have checked out. Alejandro was sitting by the window, gazing thoughtfully at the street. On the table in front of him was an old photograph showing him as a very young and carefree man, laughing with friends and his brother. There was a sticky fingerprint on the photograph, and a stack of photo albums lay beside it. Apparently, on a drunken whim, he decided to have a nostalgic evening. Most likely, Alejandro was reminiscing about that distant summer day when they all went to the river as a group. The sun was shining brightly, reflecting in the water, and it seemed like the whole world was created just for them. They swam, played volleyball, and simply enjoyed life. Javier remembered it as well. The children's voices and laughter were etched into his memory. They were so carefree and full of life. Who would have thought that they would grow up to be such adults? Who would have thought that the little boy with curly red hair would grow up to be a moral monster who would forsake his own family for the sake of profit? Back then, they were young and full of energy. They believed that they could overcome all challenges if they just believed in themselves and in their friends. And now, years later, he realizes that these moments of happiness and carefreeness formed the foundation of his life. The grown man smiled, reminiscing about his youth and feeling his heart fill with warmth and joy. It was as if he had disconnected from reality. So, why are you drinking? Javier asked. Alejandro emerged from his reverie and stared at his brother with vacant eyes. Javier repeated the question for reassurance. 
I have to move out. I don't know. I don't know, he repeated. Javier got up and left the apartment. He felt a deep sense of disappointment, not only with life, but also with everything that had transpired. The nauseating odor of spilled alcohol still lingered in his nose. Thoughts were racing through his mind, one after another. He needed to find out what was happening with Laura and, most importantly, with his little niece. Every time Javier thought about what had happened, a sense of horror gripped his soul. Many months had passed. Golden Autumn had quickly taken over the city, claiming territory after territory. Just a few weeks ago, the trees were green, but now they were dressed in gold. Autumn had come to the city and painted it with vibrant colors. The trees shed their green attire in favor of gold, red, and orange. Leaves slowly fell to the ground, creating a beautiful carpet. The sun was shining brightly, but not as warmly as in the summer. The sky was clear and cloudless. Autumn was a beautiful season, a time to enjoy the last warm days and prepare for winter. While children on the streets rejoiced in the arrival of autumn, adults were busy with preparations for the future, changing wardrobes, buying little boots, and buying rubber boots. In one of the apartments in the multi-story building, thoughts were centered around strollers, cribs, and other joys for a newborn. As Nora, smoothing her pregnant belly, was standing by the window, she looked at how much the courtyard had transformed. She was back in her rented apartment, squeezing in with her partner in a space of barely 30 square meters. Where would they put the crib? Where would they store the stroller every time? When Nora began thinking about what awaited them after the baby's birth, tears poured from her eyes. She had been warned a hundred times that this person was not suitable for her future. But no, not only did she break up the family, but now she had also ruined her own life. However, Nora didn't let sadness fill her. She lovingly caressed her rounded belly, imagining how her son was growing inside her. She dreamed of teaching him to walk and read, of walking together hand in hand. She imagined how he would hug her when he grew up. She smiled, feeling the baby move inside her. When her husband entered the room, her smile vanished from her face. She looked at the father of her child, and she wanted to grab his t-shirt and throw him out. Promising. Did she really think that this man was capable of anything? He constantly pondered this question in his mind, but couldn't find an answer. He had enough problems with the first child, and now there would be another one? Alejandro hoped he could control Nora. But she turned out to be a tough nut to crack. Alejandro took a cigarette himself, but his mind was filled with thoughts. Given his lack of income, he would soon have to give up his bad habit. Nora took out a pack of cigarettes, placed one in her mouth, and lit it immediately. Alejandro reached out to take the cigarette. Nora deftly slapped his hand, even without him, she knew that smoking was harmful. But lately, she had been so on edge that she couldn't resist her bad habit. Don't teach me how to live. If you behaved normally, I wouldn't smoke. She sharply retorted. Alejandro glanced at her with hidden thoughts. How had the tender and passionate woman turned into a bitter one with a belly? He constantly pondered this question but couldn't find an answer. Problems with the first child weren't enough and now another one was on the way. Alejandro hoped he could control Nora. However, she turned out to be a tough nut to crack. Alejandro lit a cigarette himself but his mind was filled with a swarm of thoughts. Considering the lack of income, he would soon have to give up this bad habit. He looked at Nora. Deep down, he hoped he could deceive her. He would tell her how he was striving for a good job while comfortably living on social benefits. However, the problem was that Nora was no longer holding on to him. She could file for a divorce at any time. And if his former wife could choose not to claim child support, deciding not to deal with him, Nora would squeeze him dry. I'm going to the neighboring city tomorrow. They offered me an interview. I want to check it out. It seems like a good position with decent pay. I think I'll stay there overnight, so I won't be late in the morning. What if they also have traffic jams in their city in the mornings? The man said. Nora looked at him, and in her eyes, he saw trust. Perhaps, in a purely feminine way, she wanted to believe in him. 
Or maybe she wanted to see this man not just as a biological father, but as a real father to her child. She sat down, extinguished her cigarette, and gazed out the window. Nora loved autumn. She was passionate about the yellow leaves and the wonderful, cozy atmosphere. She wanted to roam the streets all day long. If there's a trial period, I might stay for a few days. I hope everything goes smoothly, he said, making it up. Nora looked out the window again. She would have been better off not turning towards her husband. It was as if he had liar written all over his face. Nora tried her best to believe him. Could he deceive her once again? Could he really value these lies over their unborn child? Is the internship paid? She asked. They say it is, the man shrugged. At least, I think they'll hire me. I told them everything over the phone, and it seems like I fit all the criteria. So, everything will get better soon. He was lying. They both knew it was a lie. After lunch the next day, Alejandro packed his things. He threw some clothes for a few days into a sports bag and headed down to the car. The car had been in need of repairs for a long time. Alejandro looked at the windows of the apartment with nostalgia, remembering his previous life with his ex-wife. Everything was so good and peaceful back then, so cozy, but now everything has turned into a series of troubles. It was as if life itself was punishing him. He planned to meet his ex-wife and try to rebuild their relationship. If he had a one in a hundred chance of winning back his ex-wife, he would take it. The path to the clinic was quite long. While the autumn in the city was beautiful and golden, here, outside the city, everything had turned into yellow wastelands. The road was in a miserable state, clearly not maintained for a long time. The road was pockmarked with potholes and cracks that posed a danger to traffic. Alejandro kept slamming on the brakes, making sharp turns. He cursed repeatedly, narrowly avoiding falling into yet another pothole. Fields with wheat were visible on both sides of the road. The wheat was so tall that it seemed like the car was moving through a sea of golden waves. The rows of trees surrounding the fields were lush and green. The trees were adorned with bright autumn leaves that added color to the landscape. In the distance, a city was visible, looking big and cozy. Its buildings were painted in warm tones, and flocks of birds could be seen in the sky, flying south. But the closer he got to the city, the less inviting it appeared. Old, run-down houses, sad people, and some hostile faces. It was as if the whole town had plunged into gloom. Immediately after Alejandro had almost driven all the way through the town, he turned right and found himself in a forest. The trees on both sides of the road had long shed their leaves, and the dark tree trunks rose on the right and left, casting long shadows. Everything around was tinged with coffee hues due to the sun. As soon as he thought about coffee, thoughts of liqueur immediately entered his mind. Alejandro took a deep breath, turned again, and, in the distance, the building of the psychiatric clinic appeared. Even the air here was different. It was as if nature itself concealed this place from outsiders. The building of the closed clinic looked grim and unfriendly. The oppressive atmosphere was created by a sense of abandonment and neglect. The windows were dark and dirty, and the walls were stained and cracked. Tall trees grew around the clinic, hiding it from prying eyes. It seemed like this place was forgotten and deserted, and no one dared to enter. Massive black wrought iron gates loomed ahead of the car. Alejandro stepped out of the car, dusted off his pants, and approached a small booth. An elderly man sitting inside the booth peered through the tiny window. He issued a pass and then returned to his crossword puzzle. The massive gates creaked, emitting a nauseating, gut-wrenching sound. Alejandro vividly remembered that these gates had opened and closed in the exact same way the last time. In all these months, he never inquired about how life was going for his ex-wife in this place. When the nurse heard who he was and why he had come, she awkwardly shrugged and made a call. You're in the 46th room, she said. Rising from her seat, the nurse immediately rushed to assist one of the patients who couldn't get up. Alejandro remembered that the 46th room was where the head doctor resided. He was about to ask the nurse more questions, but he refrained. 
Alejandro ascended to the appropriate floor, knocked on the door, and was invited in. However, when he opened the door, he didn't recognize the man before him. It was a relatively young man with a dark, chestnut beard. Here's Alejandro. Oh, yes, I know you. It's because of you that the previous head doctor got fired. So, you could say I owe you for my career. The man said with a chuckle. Alejandro extended his hand for a handshake, but the new head doctor declined the gesture. The head doctor's office was spacious and well-lit, adorned with diplomas and certificates, testifying to the occupant's high level of professionalism. On the desk, there were photographs of family and friends, creating a cozy atmosphere. Alejandro took a seat in the chair indicated for him. The head doctor, folding his hands, looked at the newcomer with a smirk. I need to see my ex-wife, Alejandro said. Oh, how interesting that you've remembered about her. First, she's no longer here, for starters. Secondly, thank your stars that law enforcement didn't pursue you when the previous head doctor was caught red-handed. And third, I want you to leave my office for good. I know it's unprofessional to say this, but I openly despise people like you. The doctor said rather sharply. It felt as if the doctor's words were gradually sinking in. Alejandro left the office, descended the marble stairs slowly, and headed to his car. Behind him, the wrought iron gate screeched horribly once again. In his car, Alejandro was trying to digest everything he had just heard. His wife was no longer here. The previous head doctor had been arrested, and if his wife filed a complaint, he could easily end up behind bars. Within an hour, Alejandro called all his ex-wife's friends, but none of them wanted to talk to him. He was obligated to find her, or else there was a high likelihood that he would end up incarcerated. When he found her, he would fall to his knees and beg for forgiveness, and they would return to each other. Everything would become peaceful, steady, and familial one more time. There was another chance, but he had to return to the city. Alejandro stopped at a small roadside motel. The room in the budget hotel was small and cramped, with modest but clean furnishings. A worn-out carpet hung on the wall, and the floor was covered with scuffed linoleum. The bed was narrow, and the pillows were flat. When Alejandro entered the room, it felt like a prison cell. Everything was so humble and poor that staying there was uncomfortable. The bathroom was tiny, with a small sink and toilet. There was no question of taking a proper shower in this cramped space. Alejandro collapsed onto the bed, gazing up at the ceiling. The musty odor made him feel queasy, and he couldn't fall asleep until the early hours of the morning. He tossed and turned, occasionally plagued by disturbing dreams. Alejandro left the room, got back into his car, and drove back home. The car radio played in the background, but Alejandro hardly recognized the songs on this station. He was so deeply lost in his thoughts that everything around him ceased to exist. The car returned to the very town where he had lived with Nora. Alejandro turned in the opposite direction of his former lover's residence. He was heading to the orphanage where he had placed his daughter many months ago. The children's shelter was a small building situated in a quiet neighborhood of the town. It was surrounded by a peaceful courtyard where the children could play and enjoy the outdoors. Inside the shelter, there were several rooms, including bedrooms, a dining area, a playroom, and the director's office. The bedrooms had beds for the children to sleep on and wardrobes for their clothes. The playroom had toys, books, and board games to keep the children entertained. Alejandro remembered being shown around this place, but now the memories have faded considerably. The haughty carers had no intention of talking to him. They remembered the case of a perfectly capable father who had simply gotten rid of his daughter. The director decided not to talk to him at all. She only stated that his daughter had not been at the shelter for a long time. The situation had already spiraled out of control. Alejandro felt like he was losing the threads that could lead him back to his old life. There was no other option. Alejandro went back home, where Nora was waiting for him. It felt like life had come to an end right there in the courtyard of the apartment building. It was as if everyone else continued to live, but he had no more options. 
only his wife, followed by their child, earns meager salaries at the nearby supermarket. And what came after that? The total absence of prospects for the future. These thoughts made Alejandro want to cry. Well, what is it? Nora asked as soon as he entered the apartment. The scent of fresh pie filled the entire apartment. He loved her homemade fish pies. After spending several days on this trip, his thoughts still couldn't fall into place. What is it? Nora asked again as he sat down at the table. He cut himself a large piece, took a bite, and closed his eyes. He simply felt like he was going out of his mind with pleasure. You can't have the pie. You've already gained so much weight. He remarked abruptly. Oh, come on. Nora retorted, helping herself to a slice. More and more, she was convinced that she had chosen the wrong person to spend her life with. Nora was preparing herself for an impending divorce. She believed she could support herself and the child without the help of a domestic invalid. She was waiting for his answer regarding work. For herself, Nora had decided that she would try her best to make him return to a normal life until the very end. If he backed out at the last moment, she would evict him from the apartment. So, I understand there won't be a new job, right? Nora asked, still without getting answers to her questions. Alejandro simply nodded. Nora threw her hands up in frustration. She clearly had no intention of talking to him, but the growing internal turmoil forced her to start the conversation. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What kind of idiocy is this? Why should a pregnant wife support you? Will you ever be a real man? Nora asked with frustration. She was incredibly angry with him. The young woman kept waving her arms. She was so young and beautiful, and she could have had any man at work, but she had chosen this weirdo who, for some reason, she considered promising. Life had cruelly punished her for being so reckless, and now she had to deal with this man on her own in the apartment she was paying for herself. Nora, overwhelmed by her helplessness, sat back down on the chair. She didn't have the energy to argue anymore. He took her hand and looked into her eyes. He couldn't afford to lose his relationship with Nora until he had reconciled with his ex-wife. He needed to keep a backup option close by at all times. Nora, I know how disappointed you are in me. We'll have a son, and everything will be fine. You're only giving birth in two months, we'll figure it out. I'll find a job, and everything will be fine. Please understand me, I'm not some kind of robot. I have my own problems that I need to deal with. I'll fix everything. Alejandro insisted. She used to believe in him, and he saw that faith in her eyes. But now, there was only emptiness in those blue eyes. Nora got up and went to another room, leaving him alone. Alejandro tried not to remember what she was like before her pregnancy. However, the image of her young and beautiful body in black lace lingerie kept flashing before his eyes. And now there were the stretch marks, the excess weight. Perhaps it was a mistake to agree to have a child back then? Alejandro remembered the big argument they had when neither of them could make a sensible decision. And now, having decided to keep the child, Alejandro felt that both of them regretted the choice. But it was too late to change anything now. The atmosphere of the autumn night was enchanting. Very soon, all of this would disappear. The trees would be bare and black, and the long rains would begin, followed by snow. The man stood on the balcony, looking at the city lights. Down on the streets, the lampposts illuminated the path for passers-by. The air carried the scent of rain and fallen leaves. The sky was covered with clouds, with only occasional glimpses of moonlight. Would there be such light in his life again? He had been so happy with his ex-wife, but hadn't appreciated it. And now, what? Fate wouldn't give him a chance to turn everything around. He smoked and constantly played these thoughts in his mind. The man looked at the city from above and felt like he was seeing it the way he did many years ago. He remembered the years when he roamed these streets with friends and dreamed of the future. Now he stood on the balcony and looked at the same city, but from a different perspective. His head had already begun to ache from all these thoughts. 
When his wife came out to the balcony, wrapped in a warm robe, he didn't even pay attention to her. Lately, she often went out on the balcony when her stomach started to bother her. Fresh air always made her feel better. What are we going to do? No, honestly. Don't lie, she repeated. Do you want a divorce? Am I understanding this correctly? The man asked. A vivid image flashed in his mind. He admitted his wife to a psychiatric clinic and told their little daughter that her mother had died. The next picture showed him having a heated argument with his own brother at their mother's funeral, all because of money. He hoped that life would forgive him for such behavior. He let out a deep sigh but decided not to voice his thoughts to his wife. I often think about divorce. I don't think it's worth lying about it. But I feel sick when we continue living together and you keep feeding me stories. I'm ready to keep the marriage for our son's sake if you come to your senses. I'm giving you exactly two months. Starting today, two months. The woman said, enunciating each word. I understand, Alejandro replied dryly. He couldn't yell at Nora the way he used to yell at his ex-wife. Nora could quickly give him a piece of her mind and shut him up. Alejandro had no idea where to put his negative thoughts now. He was angry with both his ex-wife and his current wife. It was time to make amends with his brother and use his wise head to decide what to do next with his life. I have another job interview tomorrow. Honestly, I'm not even sure if they'll listen to me, but I'll try. If it doesn't work out, we can go through all the job listings together, he said calmly. She nodded. Nora leaned her palms against the balcony's iron railing and looked down. Right beneath their balcony was a big circle of light. A lamppost illuminated a very young couple holding hands. The woman chuckled softly. Nora thought about how much time would pass before those two would start hating each other. The next day, he left the house and got into his car. After entering the address into the GPS, he selected the shortest route to his brother's place. Alejandro drove, constantly pondering how he would talk to his brother. He needed to choose his words carefully to avoid apologies but still mend their relationship. The hustle and bustle of the city and the traffic jam were real nerve-wracking experiences for the man. He was sitting in the car, nervously checking the time, trying to estimate how much longer this situation would take. Other drivers around him were equally irked. The traffic jam was due to a road accident, and the traffic was moving at a snail's pace. Car horns blared, and drivers exchanged strong profanities. Some managed to slip onto the shoulder, squeeze between cars, or exit onto a nearby street. Alejandro refrained from making such maneuvers as he was in a different lane. He tried to keep his composure, but with each passing minute, his irritation grew. He thought about how he could be doing something more productive instead of being stuck in traffic. Eventually, the traffic jam dissipated and Alejandro was able to continue his journey. By that time, his frustration had reached its peak. His car window was rolled down. Alejandro cursed loudly while maneuvering around the gruesome accident. He didn't care about those who were in the cars. What mattered most was that he had wasted nearly two hours waiting for the road to clear. Alejandro hated visiting his brother's house. It always made him overcome envy. The Victorian-style cottage from the outside looked impressive. It was constructed from pristine white brick with a sand-colored shingled roof. The cottage's windows were large and bright, and the doors were massive and ornately carved. Around the cottage, there was a well-kept garden with flowers and shrubs. As autumn slowly receded, the yard appeared beautiful and well-maintained. Within the cottage, there were several rooms, a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and a study. Every time Alejandro thought about how Javier acquired such a property, he felt ashamed of his own passivity. Javier had worked his fingers to the bone to earn this property. Alejandro had always postponed it, claiming he'd earn it later. First, he needed to live for himself. Almost immediately, Alejandro spotted his ex-wife. She held a child in her arms. The little girl was giggling and talking. Alejandro's jaw dropped, and everything in his mind clicked into place, like pieces of a puzzle. The truth had finally surfaced. 
When Laura looked towards the approaching car, her face seemed frightened. She quickly entered the house with her daughter, and then Javier emerged from the massive doors. It seemed that in these months, he had spent even more time in the gym, making his shoulders broader. Why did you come? Javier asked without much joy, stepping outside the gate. In that moment, Alejandro realized that nobody would let him inside. He stood on his tiptoes, swaying slightly from side to side, as if trying to get a better look at his ex-wife. I came to talk, Alejandro stammered. I'm asking you nicely, Alejandro, go away from here. You didn't want to cherish your wife, now she's my wife. Kind, caring, house-proud, and affectionate as a kitten. I don't need anything but attention and love. Yes, I'm ready to shower her with gifts from head to toe because finding a woman like her is like finding a gem in the desert. Javier spoke. Alejandro swallowed loudly, and his reaction embarrassed him. He grimaced and took a step back, as if afraid his brother would attack him. He lowered his head and mumbled something. You had a family, but you traded it for a young girl. And what? Are you enjoying your life now? Javier inquired. Doesn't it make you sick? Alejandro retorted with disdain. I didn't pick her, I got her as a reward. If you didn't notice, that's your problem. If you come here with such an attitude again, you'll get what you deserve. Do you want some advice? However, Alejandro didn't want any advice. He stood before his brother with his eyes cast down. It was immediately clear how much he despised the whole situation and himself. He was furious. Alejandro clenched his jaw so tightly that his head began to ache. Get back to your girlfriend. You're already married. Enjoy your life. Get a job, take responsibility, and take care of your child. Grow up, Alejandro. When you find the strength to apologize to me and my wife, then we can talk, Javier said. Then we won't talk anymore, Alejandro retorted. Then so be it, Javier replied. He turned away and walked off. Alejandro remained standing by his car, completely alone. He was in a foul mood. He just stared at his brother's house, envying his life. It felt as if Javier had taken away all the good things that should have been Alejandro's. Yet Javier had sold all of their mother's property, split it in half, and generously handed Alejandro half of it. That had been enough to cover most of his debts. Nevertheless, Alejandro didn't feel particularly grateful. He believed he deserved everything. Alejandro got into his car, slowly driving back home. Perhaps his brother was right. It was probably time to get his act together and start doing something. While the road stretched out like a black streak, Alejandro kept brainstorming ways to change his life. He was filled with determination to find a job and maybe even change his line of work. He pictured himself becoming a good father and a decent husband. However, at that moment, he had no idea that his determination would only last for a few weeks. Despite his brother's advice, Alejandro took a completely different path. He divorced his wife, accumulated debts, and made alimony payments. He reconnected with his old friend, engaging in petty crimes. All their spare money went into drinking, partying, and finding women with low social responsibility. In rare moments of sobriety, Alejandro remembered his past, his ex-wife, his little daughter, and the happy life in his wife's spacious apartment. He remembered how she bore all the burdens, and he lived comfortably. And what should he have done next? How should he have lived from now on? Alejandro downed another glass, trying to forget about everything. He would never get his old life back, and he didn't want to start anew. Javier and Laura were living a harmonious life together. Little Wanda started calling her uncle dad very quickly, and a couple of years later, they had a little brother. They had a truly strong family. If Laura had been told that her life would turn out this way when she was still married to Alejandro, she would never have believed it. Nora reevaluated her entire life after her son was born. She decided not to enter into relationships and returned to work as soon as possible, focusing on raising her child. Fate gifted her a good husband when her son turned two. 
Nora tried not to dwell on her past and simply enjoyed the prison. She could devote herself to herself and her child without worrying about financial security. Out of all these people, only Javier remembered his brother. He never told his wife that over the years, he had tried several times to help his brother, taking him to clinics, providing money for treatment, and attempting to bring him back to a normal life. But after Alejandro deceived him once again, Javier decided it was time to end this carousel. It was hard for him to think about his brother. Just the thought of their shared childhood brought piercing pain to his heart. It was time to move on, leaving his brother to live the life he had chosen for himself. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.